And the last demos I wanted to do involves conservation of angular momentum. And uh, let me just do the demo. I won't go into too much of an explanation. Um, I will do that on Thursday. So let me do two angular momentum conservation demos. So you've seen this uh, platform before. It's the one that rotates fairly easily without friction. So you know, if I put myself up here and set mine to rotate, then ooh, oh, dizzy. I do just to rotate, you know. Okay, balance. Yeah, good. Nothing so complicated. Um, and what I'm going to illustrate is how I can. Oh, to this still. I can make myself rotate without really touching anything outside. So you know, if I just do it this way, uh, I can actually make myself rotate. And this actually is an example of conservation of angular momentum. Um, so what do you see as I try to make my upper body rotate viewed from top, uh, rotate clockwise? Like what do you see with my lower body if I try to make my upper body rotate clockwise? My lower body goes counterclockwise. Why is that? Or what principle would you use to describe what's happening here? There's a little bit of friction that I can use to gradually rotate myself. Like, do, do you remember a principle that we covered in the translational motion? What was that? Yes? So conservation momentum, but uh, what was it a consequence of? There was a, another principle that we covered before momentum that led to conservation of momentum. Yeah, Newton's third law. So we can actually borrow the language for this. We can talk about action torque and reaction torque. So my lower body is causing, um, exerting clockwise torque on my upper body, but there's a reaction torque which is causing my lower body to rotate the other way. Yeah? So what I'm actually um, going to do is I'm going to take this wheel and uh, make it spin. So right now I can make it spin without me rotating uh, for a reason that we'll explain later. And uh, so right now this wheel is, you know, viewed from top, it's not really rotating. Because when you view from top, well, it's rotating the other way. So I'm going to turn this wheel in a way that the wheel turns clockwise when you view it from top. Um, so then you see, what direction am I rotating? Yeah, I'm rotating counterclockwise. So, um, so if you look at the angular momentum of the wheel, right now, if you do from top, you would see something that's like a zero. And when I uh, exert a torque on this wheel to give it a clockwise angular momentum, there's a counter torque on me that's uh, causing me to rotate counterclockwise. <laughs> Good? Or if I cause this to rotate clockwise, sorry, counterclockwise, then there's a clockwise torque on me, causing me to rotate, you know, this way. Good, that's one. Um, I thought I had one more demo. Oh yeah, yeah, I have one more demo that kind of needs a volunteer. Um, so I need a volunteer because um, it can be dangerous, but that's not the reason. Um, uh, I need someone to spin me. So this is actually something you see um, with uh, angular momentum, that's not quite easy to see with um, translational motion. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start out with these masses outstretched. So when you look at this expression here, rotational inertia will be large. And then I'm going to bring this mass in, reducing my rotational inertia. What do you think will happen with my angular velocity? Did I hear decrease or increase? In increase if the angular momentum is conserved. So the volunteer I need is, so I need somebody to spin me because it's hard to spin myself as uh, stretched. Can someone spin me in a gentle way? <laughs> somebody. Anybody, Ranjit, come spin me. Uh, I'll tell you when it's too fast. This way? Uh, either way is fine. I think I'm used to going counterclockwise. So. Okay. No, no, my arm, arm is easier, yeah. Okay. The other way, the other way, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, a little bit faster, okay, a little bit faster. Okay, I think that's fast enough. All right, so I'm going to bring the mess in and watch. Yeah, 
So this is an example of conservation of angular momentum. And actually, you see figure skaters do this. Uh, when they do the whatever axle jumps, they, um, so as they are jumping, they are, have their arms outstretched, and in the air, they bring it in to spin faster. Good, okay, that's easy. Thank you. Um, all right, so I guess we don't have any time for cross product. So let me just do a demo that's supposed to lead to that discussion. So what Trev seen is conservation of angular momentum. So why do you think angular momentum was conserved in the two demos you have seen? So for the answer to this question, you want to think back to what was the condition you needed for you to say total momentum is conserved. What was the condition? Not work, that's, uh, that's energy. External. What about external? Yeah, so you know, the more precise version was no net imp no impulse due to net external force. But you know, it's the external force that you are worried about. So with the uh, angular momentum, it's going to be the same thing. It's the torque due to external forces. That's why it was important that this was uh, uh, rotating frictionlessly. Um, you can actually get a situation where you know, angular momentum changes. So if I hold it this from this end and let go, there will be torque due to gravity. Gravitational force acts here, pulls it down, and swings it down this way, right? I mean, I don't have to do that to, for you to be convinced that that's what's gonna happen, right? Now, uh, the motion that you will see is something called a precession. Uh, and this is the one that really uh, requires us to handle rotation like the vector that they are. That's uh, where we are going to need to use cross product. Now, when I let go of this wheel, um, it'll do this motion. Maybe you have seen it in different other classes, but otherwise, this is a quite unintuitive motion. And this is difficult to, to describe using any other tool than what we are going to introduce, I guess, on Thursday. Um, dealing with all these rotational quantities as actual vector quantities. Because um, this is what I wanted to point out, but I ran out of time. Um, so with the translational quantities, you have seen me meticulously through these vector notations, right? Uh, vectors. And with the rotation, I haven't done that because we haven't treated any of these rotational quantities as vectors. But what I am telling you is that there is a way to describe all of these, well, not this, all of these as vectors. And we are going to introduce the mathematical tool you need to do that. And that will be used to explain this precession that you just saw.